My name is Sushil Jacob. Sorry to introduce myself earlier. I'm a staff attorney at the East Bay Community Law Center. We'll introduce the law centers who've been hosting this. Um, the East Bay Community Law Center is a legal aid organization affiliated with UC Berkeley School of Law. Um, and the folks who are giving the presentations, um, a lot of them are students, law students at Berkeley. And they're working with Jane, and I, Jane is the other, uh, she's a legal fellow with us. And um, we run a community economic development clinic. Our clients are nonprofits and a lot of cooperatives. And our focus is to provide legal services to the cooperative movement. So we develop uh, education, we do legal cafes with the Sustainable Economies Law Center, which they'll introduce themselves in a, in a little bit. And um, we are part of this cooperative academy program. So who is interested in worker cooperatives in this room? All right, that's awesome. I love it when I have a captive audience. So can you yell out why you want to, what, why you're interested in worker co-ops? What's so great about them? <laughs> You're in one in your heart. Okay, so that, 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 it is hard to, to run one. All right. Tired of working without being appreciated. One appreciation for your work. Uh, it leads to more sustainable communities. More sustainable communities. You're doing my presentation for me. I love this. <laughs> more democracy. More democracy. So we have a very highly uh, worker co-op literary crowd here, that's great. Um, so some of the main reasons why we at the East Bay Community Law Center are thinking about worker co-ops is because from a legal aid organization's perspective, we are constantly receiving the fallout and brunt of our socioeconomic system. We see the results of extreme inequality in this country. We see the results of exploitation of labor both in the United States and abroad. And um, increasingly, we're concerned about climate change and the limits of our Earth's resource systems. And we think that worker co-ops provide a revolutionary alternative um, that we can start working on right now in the, uh, in the day to day. And one of the main reasons why worker co-ops provide this alternative is because it provides a way to totally reimagine the role of labor and capital in our society and in our economy. And in particular, the biggest takeaway for, from our perspective is that in a worker co-op, labor controls capital, and in our capitalist society, capital controls the rest of us. So as lawyers and law students, we are excited to promote and work with community members to build a different vision for what our economy could look like. And what we're talking about is building a new operating system for our economy, um, and what we want to call the next economy. So let's, let's uh, talk about some of the barriers to cooperative development first. I think one of the main barriers is mainstream perceptions of what a cooperative is. And I don't want to uh, you know, cast shade on um, some of the founders of cooperatives in this community, but um, we need to move beyond a perception that cooperatives are only for certain types of people, for hippies, or whatever. Cooperatives have a long and deep history in this country and around the world, and they are always present when communities are self-organizing for their own economic solidarity. So let's talk more about how co-ops impact our economy right now in the United States. Does anybody have an idea of how many cooperatives uh, exist in the U.S.? Just yell out numbers. 300. 3,000. 3,000. 40,000. 40,000. Well, that's 40,000 very close. There's 29,000 cooperatives in the United States. This covers the whole range of what we talk about when we think about co-ops. It can be ag co-ops, housing co-ops, purchasing co-ops, marketing co-ops, consumer co-ops, childcare co-ops, electric utility co-ops, and on and on. And the main thing to know is when we talk about different sectors and different types of co-ops, what we're really talking about is what service is this entity or organization providing to its members. And the type of member it is gives you the type of co-op. An ag co-op is a cooperative of farmers who, who band together and use the cooperative to market their agricultural products and get distribution and get it to retail and get a higher price than if they've just gone through the capitalist um, distribution system. A consumer cooperative is very similar, but it's consumers banding together to procure goods at cost and be able to buy those goods at a much lower price than if they were trying to go 
to the commercial uh, retail store. Housing co-op provides housing for its members. Child care co-op could be parents coming together to provide child care. And what's a worker co-op? Workers as the members coming together, right? Um, so that's what we're really here to talk about. And in worker co-ops, there's a lot of differences um, and some philosophical differences with the rest of the cooperative movement that we need to understand. But the primary thing that we need to know is that there are about 300 to 400 worker co-ops in the US right now. So if every out of 300, that's actually accurate when we're talking about just worker co-ops. Um, in a worker co-op, the workers are the members um, and thus the owners of the co-op, but they can also be employed by the co-op so it raises issues of ownership and employment that other co-ops don't necessarily have to deal with. And finally, a worker co-op, as we're going to learn, can have a board of directors, it can have a CEO, it can have management, officers, it can have stuff that you would see in a normal capitalist corporation, except the board is elected by the workers. So it's a complete inversion of the power structure. Cooperatives are united by a common set of principles. Um, and these are principles that are generally accepted across the world. Uh, they include voluntary and open membership. Their cooperatives are voluntary organizations. You're not, you're not um, drafted into a cooperative. You join because you feel it's in your own benefit to do so. They're democratic organizations, um, principally served uh, by, the princi by the principle of one member, one vote, rather than the principle of how much um, shares you own determines your voting power. It's a huge principle that we're, when we talk about governance, um, that really distinguishes cooperatives from traditional businesses. Cooperatives have a concept of member economic participation, which means that cooperatives ask that their members equitably contribute the capital, capital of the co-op and they democratically control that capital. Um, and part of that capital is the common property of the cooperative, and not just for an individual member to use for their own benefit. And um, when you invest capital into a cooperative, you receive limited compensation, for example, dividends, on that capital, because the primary purpose is not to give you a return on your capital investment. The primary purpose is to create a structure, an institution that allows you to do other things, like shop, or work, or farm. Cooperatives are autonomous and independent institutions. They're self-help organizations controlled by their members, not by big financial institutions or by governments. Uh, cooperatives engage in education, training, and information to their own membership about what it means to be a cooperative in the capitalist world, and also to the local community around them, to politicians to build a movement towards cooperation. Um, cooperatives also recognize that they thrive when they're working together. So there's a real um, movement um, across the world to, to build regional and national federations of co-ops that share resources and build movement, like, like you see in other types of trade organizations. And finally, co-ops have taken on this idea of sustainable development and concern for the community as a core principle of what cooperation is about. So those are general principles of co-ops. But worker co-ops have to deal with something a little bit different, and that's really around the issue of labor. And in a worker co-op, there's a core principle of the sovereignty of labor. And this goes back to this uh, core concept that Marx and a lot of folks have been talking about, which is the exploitation of labor or the alienation of labor um, because in a traditional capitalist enterprise, there's an owner who expropriates labor value from the laborers and makes a profit off of the laborers. And the way, one way in which we can reappropriate that labor value is by becoming the owners ourselves, but not necessarily behaving in the same way that a, a traditional owner would, but by incorporating democratic principles into how we govern this business. So, so sovereignty of labor and its analog, the idea of subordination of capital are two core principles in worker co-ops. And the idea of work subordination of capital is that worker co-ops do not generally allow for absentee investors who can control the co-op from outside. 
if any time they bring in outside investors or outside capital, they use that capital as a tool to further their own interests. So they figure out how they're going to control that capital, whether it's a loan or it's a non-voting share or some other type of arrangement. And finally, let's talk a little bit about some history. Give you a little history lesson. So when do you think the first worker co-ops were formed in the US? There probably were worker co-ops in the 1700s. Um, one of the biggest movements for worker co-ops actually happened with the Knights of Labor, which is a very large labor organization in the 1800s. And in the 1880s, they started forming worker co-ops. They formed between 200 and 300 worker co-ops in um, manufacturing and trades. Um, unfortunately, the Knights of Labor uh, grew to be an enormous labor group and then crashed. Um, and so their strategy has gone down, but their vision has not. They have the vision of creating the cooperative commonwealth in the United States. Um, other co-ops in our community are the Cheese Board Collective, which was started in 1971. And from there, they helped to launch the Arizmendi Association of Co-ops. Mandela Foods Co-op, which was launched in 2009 in West Oakland. Their mission is to build community health and wealth through business ownership, nutrition education, and increasing access to affordable, locally grown food. A lot of their mission sounds like what a nonprofit organization would actually undertake, but they're doing it as a, as a for-profit cooperative business. And finally, New Era Windows. Uh, New Era Windows is a pretty exciting co-op in Chicago. Um, it came from a fight where the workers occupied a window factory because the owners of the window factory was called Republic Windows at the time, declared bankruptcy. But the workers had a suspicion that there was something fishy going on with this window factory because the window industry was so really profitable. And then the, worker, then the owners built another factory outside of Chicago and they started hiring temp workers to do the same work. And so rather than leave that factory, the workers occupied it. And they got a lot of support um, from then Senator Obama. Michael Moore included them in, their, in his film, Love, uh, Capitalism, A Love Story. Ultimately, the, the way that story has concluded is that in 2012, they decided to buy out the business and they were able to purchase um, enough of the assets of the factory to keep it going as a co-op. They got assistance from a union, the United Electrical Workers came in and assisted them, and they got assistance from some nonprofits, including the Working World, which is something you should all know about. It's a nonprofit that helps to raise the finance worker co-ops. So today, they successfully have launched as New Era Windows Cooperative, and their goal is to create the greenest, most energy efficient windows in Chicago and all the Midwest. Um, two other inspiring examples of co-ops. How many of you heard, have heard of Mondragon, the co-ops in Spain? Yeah, they're, they're super famous. Um, they're like the mecca of worker ownership. Uh, Mondragon is a network of 120 cooperatives industrial scale cooperatives with about 80,000 worker owners. They have their own bank. They have a large scale grocery store the size of Safeway called Dorowski. Um, and they have a bunch of factories that produce automotive parts and appliances. They are also working on constructing the Ground Zero train station in New York City. They constructed the Guggenheim factory and it's all under worker control. Um, but its history is really interesting because it started uh, under the era of Franco in the Basque region of Spain um, as a means for um, Basque people to self-organize despite heavy persecution by Franco. And then, and now, Mondragon has signed an MOU, or a Memorandum of Understanding with the steel workers, the US steel workers, one of the largest um, unions in the US, to figure out how can we launch industrial scale worker co-ops in the US. In Cleveland, Ohio, there's an initiative called the Evergreen Co-ops. And they've taken on a project that integrates the buying power of local institutions, including the university, the hospital, the city, and redirecting those institutions' purchasing power towards locally owned businesses, including a energy efficiency company, um, an urban greenhouse and an industrial scale laundry, commercial scale laundry, um, that are serving those institutions. And all of those are worker owned green businesses. 
So in sum, why do we want dogs? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, dignity, higher job satisfaction, uh, lower turnover rates. So from a business perspective, they can make more sense. Um, higher incomes for the workers. Um, more sustainability and involvement in the local community by workers and by businesses. And finally, there's uh, a lot that's been written recently on resilience of cooperatives in economic downturns. Uh, the UN did a study on resiliency in co-ops, and, and the UN said that cooperatives have a tendency to produce a type and level of organization, organizational innovation that significantly contributes to the economic sustainability of the enterprise. So despite job losses and closures all across Europe with the recession, co-ops, worker co-ops in particular, have been more resilient in weathering the downturn. And one of those examples is actually Mondragon. Um, uh, and their relocation of um, workers after one of their large factories had to close. So, that is my introduction to why we should care about worker co-ops and why they're awesome. And now we're going to get into the how-tos of, well, what is a co-op legal entity 